Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. You may have noticed a few things. First, that I had intended for us to cover The Amazing Spider-Man, A Riot at Robot World this week, and this is, you know, clearly not it. Secondly, that the background's a bit... different. So, I was working on some new defense protocols at the house the other day. Alright, this new security system should ensure that nothing breaks into the house during Halloween this year. Self-destruct sequence activated. Self-destruct in T minus 10. Vega, we're moving! Eight, seven. You know, one of these days I'll actually be able to blow up an enemy with that. Fortunately, Nimue was able to teleport everyone and our belongings out. Unfortunately, since that house was a rental, it soon got around about my reputation for battles and destruction and, well, more or less no one would rent to me. So I had to buy a house! You bought a house? You, you bought a house! I bought the house! Your reputation's so bad, no one even give you a loan! I only agreed to let you move in with me because you covered all the moving costs and the bills! And I am eternally grateful! Except, except, except like before! I moved in with six other people! Even the dead guy is here! Yeah, it's gonna get annoying next month. Look, I will make all this up to oh, you. Oh yes! You're gonna make this up to me. I haven't thought about what I'm gonna do, but it's probably gonna involve a lot of bootleg My Little Pony toys and your anus! I'm talking right up your apple jack hole! I'm not gonna be fluttershy about it! So, any yes. So, anyway, Patreon sponsored review time again. A few years ago, I talked about my love of the Jack Webb show Dragnet. Get spiked in the booty hole. A lot of people have had to reevaluate our relationships with police procedural shows or other similar things in light of recent events and revelations, and Dragnet is most certainly on my list in that regard. It's important to remember that it's okay to still like them. Even before said reevaluation, I pointed out that Dragnet is incredibly dated, from its goofy portrayals of hippies to some episode endings that are just perplexing and bad, and in particular an episode which specifically listed homosexuality as a bad thing. It's just you need to be aware of those problematic elements and determine for yourself if it affects you as a person. What sort of things you want to give support behind, especially if, say, it's someone actively profiting off of it versus someone long dead. Or how it could be affecting your viewpoints on the rest of the world. Even I'm guilty of this. Dragnet, especially watching at a young age, shaped a lot of views I had on the police and my view have since changed considerably, and I didn't recognize the influence it had on me until I was 30-something. It's good to reevaluate yourself and change. But the reason I bring Dragnet up at all is because of its creator, Jack Webb, and how it relates to the comic today. After four years of working on Dragnet's 1960s revival series, Jack Webb decided he wanted to focus on other shows in his Mark 7 limited company. In particular, a spin-off of Dragnet called Adam-12. In the middle of Adam-12's fourth season, a kinda sorta spin-off of it was produced called Emergency. In that characters from Adam-12 appear in it, but otherwise didn't have a basis in the universe beforehand. Apparently Adam-12 is also a fictional TV show in Emergency, so that must have been really confusing when those characters appeared in crossovers. Unlike Dragnet and Adam-12, the series focused on firefighters, paramedics, and emergency room doctors in a fictional station and hospital in Los Angeles. As you may have gathered, we're looking at the comic tie-in to the book. Here's the weird part, though. You'd think, given the tie-in nature with this sort of thing, that it would have been produced by Gold Key, which seemed to hold a monopoly on all TV-licensed comics at the time. But no, this was produced by Charlton Publications, of all people. Which now just makes me wish there was a crossover between Emergency and Blue Beetle. Think about it! Him and the Question investigating, like, an arson or something, and the victims are treated by the Emergency cast! I looked up a random episode on YouTube, and the show itself seems fine, although it too seems to have its dated elements. The one I saw was Season 5, Episode 6, The Indirect Method, where a bunch of the firefighters are helping a new paramedic trainee. But she's a woman! <laughs> 
was 1975 for crying out loud, and the firefighters were acting like they never worked alongside a woman, despite having regular contact with women doctors and nurses. Friggin' Dragnet felt more progressive on that front, and they had an episode that spent the first few minutes explaining how social security information is being kept on these newfangled things called computers. But hey, we're here to talk about comics, so let's dig into emergency number one and see how they handled this kind of thing. I had a physical copy. I think it got blown up with the house. Welcome to a top the fourth wall where bad comics burn. Lynn Carr is gonna teach you all a lesson you all learn. Brodsky, you're not the smartest. Life out the Cover's pretty decent, showing our firefighters in the midst of a rescue next to some kind of high voltage wires. The painted style looks okay, though the fire truck in the background looks like it's melting. We open with a much better looking truck rolling down the road, sirens blaring. Squad 51, said the dispatcher at Los Angeles County Fire Department headquarters, and John Gage replied, Squad 51, Squad 51, we're gonna do all the dialogue and narration boxes, over. There's a chemical fire at a warehouse, and our heroes and lead characters of emergency, paramedics Roy DeSoto and John Gage, are dispatched to deal with it. The two soon arrive at the fire. The warehouse looked like something out of a madman's vision of hell. Definitely. Otherwise, why would hell have firefighters trying to put out the flames? They soon find an injured man outside, passed out from smoke inhalation. Better get him to Kelly Brackett for a check. But in emergency, Dr. Kelly Brackett had serious problems of his own. I'll tell you there, Bobo, either this kid has a light bulb up his butt or his colon has a great idea. No, he's dealing with a patient with his nurse, Dixie, and said patient clearly has radiation burns on his arms. They want to know how the hell he got said radiation burns, but he refuses to answer. Only that he wants to be fixed up and let out. We have no medication for stupidity, mister. Well, you might not, but Perry Cox does. You'll find that this first one is for an extra large mallet to help you pound some sense into yourself. Oh, I love episodes like this that let me go nuts on the Scrubs clips. Dixie realizes that he must have been handling something radioactive, and they wonder if such a thing was present at the chemical warehouse fire. Speaking of, the firefighters have moved into the warehouse to try to get the blaze under control. Pull back! There's naphtha stored on the other side of those drums! Naphtha? My god, it'll remove their stains! Yeah, not sure if that's a recurring typo or just an outdated way of referring to naphtha, a flammable liquid that was, for a time, used in the aforementioned Fells naphtha laundry soap. In any event, a fireman is knocked out from the smoke and fire. Probably would help if they were wearing any kind of gas masks or other firefighting equipment instead of looking like they came out of the 1920s with those uniforms. And while he's being treated, they quickly determine that this was arson. Gasoline cans were found in the office, and the trucking manifests have been destroyed, which prevents them from knowing for certain everything that's in the warehouse. They try to contact the warehouse's manager to get a manifest from him, but it's his day off and he's not answering his phone. The cops are dispatched to try to find the manager, DeWinter, and get the info from him directly. They arrive at his house, but a neighbor informs the officers that he took his family to a lake in the mountains 12 miles away that morning. They speed off to the neighbor's confusion. Cops! Always speeding around! Anyone would think they was firemen! Yeah, but as has been pointed out by others, there's a reason why there isn't a song called F the Fire Department. I mean, aside from the one made by my own theme song creator, Vincent E.L., but that one's deliberately satirical, so I don't think it counts. It's also a great song. Go buy it. The cops race to the area DeWinter is staying at and quickly find him, who also very quickly deduces that his warehouse is on fire. He fills them in on the warehouse's contents. There's naphtha in there, and oil, and bales of rubber. 
But that's not the worst. I've got tanks of oxygen and acetylene in the north end of the building. Let's see, there's an entire section of oily rags, the hundred boxes of thermite, the nitroglycerin, the kerosene, the gunpowder piles next to the industrial furnace. And oh, did I mention the live grenades in the west end? Just... Good God, is this an arson supply warehouse? But yeah, after they radio the list, they work to get to the oxygen and acetylene tanks to get them out before the heat turns them into bombs. He's not even done either. Rubber tires and 60,000 gallons of paint thinner are in there as well. What's astounding is that this was a deliberately set fire and not an accident. Oh, and the cops almost end up running over a kid when he runs out into the street to get his ball and yell at the kid for this. There's certainly something to be said for the kid running out into the middle of traffic, but the cops stop to berate the kid instead of checking to make sure they're okay. Though this does make me wonder why they're in such a hurry, the manager is relaying the information he has while they go. His physical presence may not actually affect anything. In addition, this is supposedly happening in the city given the shots before this and during it, but that means that they waited several minutes before he started listing off the contents of the warehouse, since they were just in the mountains. In any case, they redirect their ire from children to the manager, wondering why the hell this flammable material isn't in a fireproof area. He says the location was approved because of the presence of a sprinkler system, which is especially hilarious because chemical fires can't always be put out with water. But the cop in this case points out that the real issue is that the main valve for the sprinkler was closed, probably by the arsonist. Once he arrives, the firefighters ask if there's anything else still inside. He checks over what they've pulled out. Did you move out the ship? of radium chloride? It's a privately owned consignment packed in conformance with the safety standards. According to the dialogue, it took half an hour to get there! You listed off every single explosive under the sun that you stored in this place, but didn't mention the radioactive material?! They confirm that none of the firefighters found the bright orange lead containers that housed the radium chloride. They quickly figure out that whoever started the fire was after the radium chloride because of its value. Still, them being firemen and paramedics, this is a job for the cops now, so Roy and John head out, deciding to check in at the hospital to look into the fireman that John had rescued. John talks to Dixie and says the firefighters already been sent back to the station and mentions the radiation burn victim. Realizing this guy, Davin, might be the one behind this, John takes a look at him in his clothes, which reek of gasoline. Davin is clearly sick, suffering from radiation poisoning. Where are his clothes, Dixie? Right over here. Better wear gloves. He was filthy. And, you know, because of the radiation thing. And before you think they don't actually know that's the case, nope. John just picks up the clothes and then tells Dixie to have them disposed of and get herself checked out for radiation, which she says she's already done. Kelly Brackett briefed me on proper procedure, which is why these radioactive clothes are just sitting in a neat pile for firefighters to run their hands over. 20 minutes later, the cops have been informed, and it seems Davin already had a record a mile long for assault with a deadly weapon, theft, etc. Roy and John decide to head back to the station, talking about Roy's wife Joanne's birthday party that they're going to attend later. However, John says he has a hunch about where the radium chloride is, and talks to the captain about joining the cops in the investigation, which seems a bit odd. I suppose rescue personnel like him wouldn't be an absurd thing to have along for this, but he requisitions a Geiger counter to help look, so why wouldn't the cops already have one? In addition, the panels make it look like he's the lead on this investigation and not the cops. They head to the rat hole where Davin lived and the Geiger counter quickly finds the radium, which has been taken out of its container. I'm probably getting a heavy dose of radiation right now. Can't wait to see what kind of superpowers I get from this. Oh, and apparently he was the only one who went up! Or the cops just dropped him off, because when he runs out again, he has to flag down another cop car to help and explain the situation to them! Officer Hall and I are looking for a man named Davin. And where is Officer Hall? And why can't he radio this in himself? What do you mean you're looking for Davin? He's still at the hospital! Spoilers, he will escape from the hospital later, but John doesn't know that yet. It feels like these events were put out of order. Anyway, he continues. He has radium chloride in his possession. Radium? That's bad news. Yeah, radioactive material. It sure is a real bummer. What can we do to help, Gage? What do you mean? 
mean, what can you do to help? He's a firefighter. This is your job. Is this like Baywatch where the lifeguards take on police and detective duties? Is John going into burning buildings, finding someone and yelling, my save! Anyway, John suspects that Davin is too stupid to do this job on his own, so he must have an accomplice. The cops know who Davin is and that he hangs out with some guys at Leo's Grill. Plus, he used to fence stuff to a guy named Becker at a body and fender shop. Said shop has been closed for a few months, so they decide to check the grill first. Davin isn't in Leo's Grill, Hall. We'll check later. He's at the hospital! Unless you let him go, which... Why? He has radiation sickness and he's the top suspect! They check out the garage, but John gets attacked from behind, his wallet, badge, and Geiger counter all stolen. I hate to report it, Hall. They'll laugh me out of the firehouse. Ha! You got mugged by an unknown assailant, dork! He decides to get checked out at the hospital. In the emergency ward, Nurse Dixie McCall and Dr. Kelly Brackett again had problems of their own. Okay, we have a 41-year-old male who is as orange as an NBA game ball. Who can tell me why? It's here where they establish that Davin had escaped the hospital by stealing an orderly's clothes. Naturally, they're worried about him, since radiation sickness can go off and on with symptoms, and what's worse is that in his state, he could be contaminating others with it. John walks back out to Officer Hall. More trouble, Hall. Davin skipped, and he's radioactive. That can't be good! They head back to Leo's grill but in separate cars for some reason. And apparently John owns a cop car? What? On the way, John calls Roy to let him know he won't be at the birthday party because of his investigation into the place. I know that place, Johnny. Wander in and start trouble with one of their regulars and you'll get scalped. Also, isn't this way outside the scope of your job? He meets with Hall outside the bar, who wonders why the guy would leave the hospital given how sick he is. There'll be some criminal charges to face. He knows that. As a cop, however, I apparently did not know that. They find him in the corner of the restaurant, already shaking from the radiation sickness. John trying to convince him to get out of there. Don't you dig it, man? You're a walking bomb! No, 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 no. The human bomb was a quality comics character, not Charlton. Easy to confuse when they both got bought up by DC. The other patrons in the place spot this happening and say they need to call Becker and get the radium out of the garage. While Davin is transported back to the hospital, John did notice the other people leaving as they were talking, so they're likely headed to the garage. The cops head over to intercept, John going on the justification that as a paramedic, he can provide medical support to anyone injured. At the garage, a shootout ensues, but the cops are victorious. Put your hardware away, Steve. Officer Hall has him prisoner. This is his gun. I figured I'd get my fingerprints all over it. You ought to get in the police department, Gage. Or else stick to your own line of work. Look, I won this cop car at the police auction, and I need to justify owning it somehow. John recovers his stolen stuff, and Hall says he'll drop him off at Station 51 to clean up for the birthday party. Which just once again makes one wonder why they took separate cars then, or if the birthday party is even still going on at this point. And so our comic ends with Brackett and Dixie observing Davin as he slowly dies from radiation poisoning. Avoid any further contact, Dixie. There's absolutely nothing more we can do for him. It's so stupid, Kelly. Why do people wreck their lives like this? Really makes you stop and think about all those people ruining their lives by stealing radioactive material. This comic kinda sucks. I say kinda because the framework of the story is actually perfectly fine. There's tension, a good investigation, procedural work. It's a solid premise with plenty of action to keep things interesting. The devil's in the details, though. Looking for Davin when they know where he is. A character not relaying critical information when he should have. John, for no reason, deciding to join the investigation and seemingly taking it over despite it not being his field. Characters being fairly nonchalant about friggin' Ray radioactive materials being stolen, and how many innocent people could be hurt by someone affected by it being at large. And then the odd PSA-esque ending, where it's almost like originally this was supposed to be like drugs or something, where someone ruined their lives with them. But instead it's, when will people learn they shouldn't steal radioactive materials? It's certainly not the worst comic we've looked at by a long shot, but it is very sloppy in the writing. Artwork, however, is perfectly fine, keeps the action going, and it never gets bogged down, aside from John worrying about the birthday party while in the middle of a hunt for the dude who could be spreading radiation around with him. Next time, we return to something a little more awesome, with more of Mr. T and the T-Force.
Incidentally, the original captain of the squad in Season 1 was a guy named Dick Hammer. I'd make fun of that, but it's actually the guy's real name, and he was indeed a real firefighter, so kudos there. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!